Next curve. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Rethink Podcast. I'm Leonard Lee, Managing Director of Next Curve. And today, today I have two very special guests, very, very special guests joining me to talk about Mobile World Congress 2022, which took place last week from the 28th of February to the 3rd of March in Barcelona, Spain. Lovely Barcelona, Spain. And uh, so today I have uh, Peter Jaric, who is the head of GSMA Intelligence, which is the research arm of GSMA. And we have Rob Tiffany, Managing Director of Digital Insights. Gentlemen, welcome. Thanks for, thanks for having us. Good to be here. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. I think this is going to be fun and informative for our audience. So why don't we uh, get into it? So Peter, um, let's get started here with, um, you know, how did you guys think that the event went this year? I mean, obviously so, the pandemic, you know, kind of uh, threw some <laughs> you know, monkey wrench over the last two years. Yeah, so I think, you know, and and you you described my team really well which i think is great because not people don't always get that so you know my team gsma intelligence research and consulting arm and so from our perspective you know last year was actually okay i sent a, a decent team but this year was, was obviously much better right i sent right. more analysts we had more meetings um you know it was it was really great for my team to go out there and, and engage i think from a, a broader show perspective you know, the, the, the GSMA put out its its press release after the show, right? Over 60,000 unique uh, people attending the person, right? Wow. 1,900 or over 1,900 exhibitors, you know, great year, over 1,000 speakers, 97% of which were in person. Um, and uh, I think particularly good from, from our perspective uh, is more than a third, about 36% being, being women. So, you know, I think it was a great, great show uh, from, from my perspective, you know, particularly because, uh, and it's not that fewer people make a worse show or more people make a better show, but, but when you right. get that many people, there's a definite buzz about it. Right. You have those meetings that you just sort of serendipitously bump into someone and you yes. have a meeting you, you didn't intend to, which is great because, You'll always have cancellations you didn't intend to, but it, it, it makes it for a more vibrant, uh, yeah, just more vibrant. I think that that's really what the, the value of those events are for. And I mean, you, you guys know, you know, you guys know this as analysts, just the opportunity to have all those insights buzzing around where you can pick up little things here or there and form a story. It, yeah. It's always amplified when you've got more people. Uh, and I think that's, that's, what, that's what my team saw. Yeah, well, you know, I I, th I thought in the previous years there may may have been too many people. Uh, I, for me, I thought it was just right. You know, it was the Goldilocks event. So, I mean, Rob, what were your impressions? I mean, what did you think about the event this year? Yeah, <clears throat> I think Goldilocks is the right word. It felt right. Um, not too crowded. I wasn't in traffic jams the whole time going through the event, going through Fiera Gran Via. Um, didn't have too much messiness around town either, which was good. No. Um, you know. Uh, God, I think you said the right word. Serendipitous was huge. Just running into people is kind of magical. You know, you go there, you've already got a bunch of meetings set up with folks. You know, I think of I think of going to the event as, as half meetings, half wandering around aimlessly, you know, checking out everything that's new uh, and stumbling, bumbling, talking to folks uh, at the different stands. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I I think the 60,000 folks was a great sweet spot for that. Um, it was great. And I, and I loved all the unexpected bumping into people that I hadn't seen in a long time. It was so refreshing to be back in person. Some of this was, you know, a function of COVID. I mean, I don't know if you, if either of you would have, would have remembered this, but in, in, in previous editions, when it was, uh, I think in 2019 and before the four YFN uh, space was, was over at Fira of Yeah. Uh, and they pulled it in. Obviously, some of that is just because of, you know, there was there was more more space, and obviously you could you know fill up the the space better. But the number of people I talked to that were like, that was just really cool, right? And that was a really cool space. I think for anyone who had been to CES and you go to the I forget what they call that space, right? It was sort of like in the basement of the sands. Yeah, the when startup. Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The right. startup startup zone. Yeah, or whatever. The sea, it's called, yeah. the sea of the sea of card tables. 
right? Where, yeah. where everyone is out there with, with everything from, you know, really cool consumer AI to uh, I've got an AI driven animated tail that you wear, right? And, and they're all there, right? And it's some weird, some kind of cool. And I think that bringing a little bit of that to, to MWC, the number of people that were like, wow, I'd never, I'd never seen that. Those small companies are, are pretty, yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, I, you, I think you hit it right on the head. I think that because you're right, we would always have to go down to Fira Montjuic to check it out. Um, I know I've I've often reflected the last few years when I meet when I say that I mean 2019 and and back. Um, that was always the highlight for me is four years from now because yeah. it is kind of magical um, seeing so much innovation from all these great entrepreneurs. Um, and so you're right, pulling it into the big event where everyone can see it because I think a lot of you know how like people are they're busy out of sight, out of mind. Uh, and so they may not hop on the bus or get on the Metro to right, go down there yeah. and check them out. And so the fact that they were right there and there's so many of them and they're so enthusiastic and, you know, they're just really thrilled that you're there yeah. walking up and talking to them about whatever their little thing was. Uh, I, I think it's great. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, 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 it's the number of people I've heard that would always in the past, who I, I, I dedicated half a day or I dedicated a whole day. And it always seems like a great idea. Just like all those people that say, oh. I plan my meetings by hall. Right, you know, this day I do yeah. this hall and I plan all my meetings. Yeah. I never. It, it sounds like a great idea. I just never, like, never do that, right? Because you you plan it and then something gets in the way and yeah, gets yeah. The way, you just don't do it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if I think about hall time and I don't plan like you said, but there's no doubt I spent more time. What were they? Number seven, six, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. I spent more time probably there proportionally than any of the other halls actually, uh, just digging in because there's so many more of them concentrated, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, to find out what their little thing is, yeah. uh, and they're so passionate. It's great stuff. Well, you know, guys, it was still a huge event, right? Uh, I got a lot of exercise. I think uh, you guys took up seven of the halls, right? Yeah, seven halls, yeah. right? So, for those of you who are wondering, it it was it was a big event still, and. Um, and uh, the um, I, I thought the sessions were great. And uh, what you know what I'm really curious, gentlemen. So what were your impressions? So as you were going through the halls, talking to different companies, bumping into uh, interesting um, uh, ventures that are maybe going to be that big th next thing. What were what were your impressions about the industry? What were your sort of these um ahas that you uh, formulated as you were uh, you know going through your day wow just you know i had some big impressions you know big takeaways not necessarily you know kind of when i think of just kind of big topics or that you know and you don't know that they're going to be going into it mm -hmm. um but you you would pick up on themes when you walk around, um, you know, because aside from all the meetings, I do just walk around and go talk to everybody uh, and see what's what. And I know it was interesting that kind of this dichotomy, this thing between all the telecom, the CSPs, uh, the mobile operators, and then all the big giant tech companies and hyperscalers. Yeah. And there was something they were both going into each other's business was my big takeaway. Um, it, it, you know, well, actually the, the, a lot of the, the mobile operators, they were all pushing some variation of industry 4.0 industrial IOT mm -hmm. at their stands. You know, I saw lots of KUKA robots. I saw a lot of them just kind of push, you know, cause everybody's there. It's a marketing event and you're, you've got a, you're creating a narrative, right. For the customers. And so I'd say that on the telecom side, I saw a narrative of, hey, we're all in with this whole industry 4.0 industrial IoT thing. Um, and you go, oh, wow, I didn't know you were in the same business as GE and Siemens and Hitachi mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But at least from a connectivity perspective, that's their, their entree into that space, um, which is fine. You know, as someone who does this industry 4.0 stuff, you know, some of the capabilities of mass customization of making cars and things in the future that actually can only happen in an agile way using wireless networks, wireless private networks that are high speed. You know, factories today are based on ethernet cables, lots of expensive ethernet cables to get that speed and latency. And so that's the narrative they're pushing there. And I think that's fine. Um, and then all the big tech companies, Microsoft, VMware, all those guys, 
they all decided to become telecom companies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were all talking about how they're doing RAN and they're doing 5G and they're doing OSS BSS. And if you asked any random person, you know, a few years ago, would you ever expect to see that? They'd say, no way. And yet here we are. Yeah. Peter. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think for me, sort of diversity was, was the key theme. And you kind of see that in, in a bunch of different ways, right? So I think, let's think about the cloud players. Yeah. Right, the cloud players, you saw announcements for, from all of them. They all came to talk about right. what they were doing. And what I think is interesting is, you know, they're all very clear. And I think a bunch of us were on the, you know, the pre-briefings beforehand where they made it clear and then their announcements that, look, you know, we're all here to partner. You know, we're here to partner with the operators. We're here to partner with the telcos. We're not trying to take their business. But what I think is interesting is if you look at the models, right, you have this range of models from, and, you know, whether or not you want to think about Rakuten as a cloud player, that's kind of the model they're going after, right? Mm-hmm. Posting a lot of functions, serving operators, um, you know, from, from that sort of model. And they're obviously going to do, you know, most of that, right? Pull in partners, do a lot of, you know, essentially every function that someone could need. Mm-hmm. Then you've got, on the other hand, Amazon, which is sort of bring us whatever and we'll host it. And then you had Microsoft where, you know, we saw Microsoft launch their 5G core and you have this interesting diversity of models there of, you yeah. know, do you want everything from them, nothing from them, somewhere in between. And then on the IoT side of things, right? You do have this interesting diversity of some who are definitely trying to get into use case specific, right? Vertical specific solutions, investing in it. And I think the bigger push, and Rob called us out in private networks, just the bigger push, to look, we'll roll out the private network with capabilities that can allow you to do whatever you need. And again, it's a diversity of, you know, diversity of solutions depending upon what the, the enterprise needs. And I think Rob, Rob hit it in terms of private networks. Mm-hmm. For me, that was, you know, there was a lot of buzz around Open RAN. There was a lot of buzz around just the number of, of different devices from some of the, the, the non-incumbent players that were launched, you know, a lot of buzz around sustainability. Private right. networks, I think, yeah. was kind of, it was under the radar, but it shouldn't have been. I mean, Cisco, hmm. HPE, you know, you saw the Qualcomm Microsoft yeah. tie up. You saw, I mean, so many different private network launches that it was, yeah. it wasn't a huge buzz. And I think that's, that, that diversity thing also implies, I mentioned Open RAN, yeah. right? Going into this, and, and I've said this a number of times, and I mentioned this on a, on a panel on the first day, you know, the discussion from Open RAN around Open RAN and VRAN is, you know, Intel has been incredible in, in driving that space. And, and yeah. you know, Pat, Pat Gelsinger in terms of when, when, you know, on numerous calls will say, hey, we've, you know, 90, 95%, you know, some just incredible number of, of Open RAN, VRAN is on Intel platforms. And, and I commented, I said, that is super great news for Intel, yeah. super not great news for the Open RAN and VRAN community because it, it yeah. points that it's all dependent upon one vendor. And, right. and we saw this, you know, we saw this year a bunch of news from Qualcomm, a bunch of news from Marvell. Right. You saw AMD get in there. Right. Right. The, the amount of different solutions that are out there in terms of, and, and again, Rob pointed out, you know, seeing some of these IT players playing in the RAN space was kind of a weird thing, but they want to host those functions on their servers. And so mm-hmm. it was, for me, that choice and that diversity, which is key for, for scaling and moving the industry forward, was, was really on display this year. Yeah. And, you know, to your last point there, Peter, I think that's one of the things that uh, needs to be talked about more as the Open RAN community looks at um, scaling their ability to, del- to deliver, right? Is wh- who is going to actually integrate and build these systems, right? There's a lot of technology vendors out there today. A lot of people who are sitting kind of on the sidelines with the tools and saying, okay, developers jump in. But who are these folks that actually have the capability to take these open RAN solutions to the market at scale? I think that's one of the big um, gaps at the moment. And uh, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, yes, there are system integrators out there, but we're looking at something that's uh, kind of a the way that I, I've heard it described, and it, I think it's true. It's a plane that's in flight, and you know, you're building a plane that's in in flight, right? And and that I think is going to be one of the challenges and things that the industry has to reconcile with over the next, uh, quite frankly, the year. 
Because one of the things I kind of I, I wrote about was the fact that this year is going to be the year uh, of uh, you know sort of the Squid Games for Open RAN. People are you know players are going to have to start to team up and figure out how to deliver at scale quality in order to make um, Open RAN work. Right? It, it, it's not just about disconnected technologies and in an open ecosystem, it's about delivering uh, solutions, channeling all that diversity, as you guys have been talking about, into actual solutions that work in the field. And I think that's going to be the big, uh, for me, I thought that was my key, one of my big key Im impressions. The other thing I, I thought was 5G kind of oddly took a back seat. You guys are, you know, you were talking about open <laughs> RAN, right? Open RAN kind of dominated the whole conversation. I, that, that was one of my impressions, and I thought it was really interesting. Um, and um, I guess a bright spot in terms of 5G is it sounds like we're starting to get into, uh, you know, come out of the trough of disillusionment that we've suffered over the last two, three years. And that might be a good thing, right? And we're, instead of talking about innovation, we're talking more about modernization, right? So modernizing the networks and the infrastructure and then uh, having a basis for innovation. I think, you know, the innovation conversation uh, was a bit of uh, the cart before the horse. You know what I'm saying? If you don't have the infrastructure to support innovation, then it, you're not really dealing with the innovation engine uh, of the future, right? Yeah, so. I, 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 one, I think, I know, I know you mentioned you could add some graphics after. I hope you add an explanation for those folks who just are still scratching their head about what Squid Games uh, are. Because I'm sure there's. <laughs> like I mean, I know every, <laughs> we have a podcast. There's a <laughs> Next Curve podcast. It's called <laughs> The State of Open RAN. So watch yeah. that, and you will know what Squid Games and Open every, RAN is about. Okay, good, good. Because you know, I assume everyone who, you know who's, who's listening or watching in are you know are, are, are cool and hip. But you know, I also figure there's yeah. some folks that are just uh, not even. Uh, I mean, I've been. I've been at, at high level telecom exec meetings with people who, who didn't really, um, yeah, there were a lot of trends that always uh, sometimes go, go over their head. You know, I, I would just say on the innovation front, I think you're right, but there's a couple of things that, that struck me. One, yeah. you know, one of the things on the innovation open run brand front that people are really talking about is the, you know, the RAN intelligent controller, yeah. uh, the RIC, uh, and really the RIC being this, this tool for, you know, allowing the integration of, of third-party X apps, R apps, applications, yeah. functions, call them, call them what you will. Yeah. So an interesting idea there of, of will you see new innovation and, and regardless of the how the plane is being built as it's in flight, the idea of being able to support some more innovation there and the idea of if this stuff can be mixed and matched, can you have smaller vendors developing equipment that maybe larger vendors wouldn't develop to specifications for, right? And, and, you know, wouldn't say, hey, you know, if you go to Ericsson and say, I need this done for my special vertical solution, they're going to look at you and go, uh, you need to be, write me a much bigger check, right? I, I don't right. deal with, you know, deals that that's small or I don't develop my, my code or my solutions, but a smaller player might. So I think that's interesting. But the the piece that, you know, you talk about, I think, I think you hit it, Rob, in terms of conversations you have, and I think you mentioned this, I think you know, Leonard sort of you know, things you hear and piece together. One of the things that for me was particularly surprising was, you know, the Huawei launch. Huawei made a launch about their, uh, you know, intelligent, um, their, their intelligent RAN uh, solution. Yeah. Their intelligent RAN solution, which was yeah. a, actually it was their RAN intelligence solution, which included the intelligent ran engine that had near, that supported near time and non real time functions, just like, the Rick and Open RAN. And I think for me, what's interesting on the innovation front is how things like Open RAN might drive the industry, but also how, you know, maybe they also drive the way things are built, even internal to a vendor if they don't support openness, right? right? Maybe, maybe you look at those things and go, I can borrow that. I don't need to open it up to someone, right? But, but can I, can I benefit? And uh, yeah, I think that was a, uh, for me, I think it was, it was interesting to see. Right, and Ericsson has their own similar offering, right? They have, uh, a, you know, um, a service management orchestration uh, offering that they announced um, a couple of months fall. ago. Yeah, in the fall, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, 
Yeah, and and that's one of the things I think you're you're bringing up a really important point. The, this whole concept of um, uh, you know open doesn't necessarily preclude proprietary, and I think that's one of the things that we're starting to see. Uh, you know, and that's something that I, I think Samsung. Uh, networks clearly recognizes that hey look at s- uh, certain aspects of the ran uh, you're going to be going proprietary with certain elements um, whether it's down at the silicon level or maybe even certain um, types of radios depending on the requirement right and and the environment that you're deploying in and so th- we're going to really be looking at a um, a, a mixed bag of things as uh, CTOs and engineers go out into the field and, and make decisions on how they design um, their, um, their uh, you know, uh, brands, basically. And, uh, and so it, it, I, I think this whole idea that everything is going to be open, while it sounds really nice, the thing is, is that what we've seen in the IT space is proprietary, actually, has proven to scale incredibly well and continues to be highly competitive. And so that's something that I think the industry needs to understand. And it's not about the world becoming open. It's about being interoperability can be solved in a number of different ways. And the IT world has done it without necessarily shifting completely to open. And uh, and so the this is something that I think that the open ran community needs to uh, meditate on a bit right um so maybe they'll meditate on it i doubt it <laughs> i i doubt it as well you know what? they'll eventually right. learn yeah, there's always that. whether they like it or not <laughs> You're right there's always the whole open power to the people thing yeah obviously uh but the best obviously the best analog in the world to closed and proprietary is being number one is still apple shows you every day that their completely closed system dominates the whole planet in a giant way. Um, And so I know there will always be barbarians at the gate saying, open your interfaces, open, you know, that kind of stuff. And that's going to keep, and and more power to them. Um, But, uh, but it's, the struggle is real (laughs) for sure. Yeah. I mean, I mean, even, I mean, and and it's interesting. I, I think there are one just, I think this is, and I guess I should go back and listen to the the, the podcast on, on Open RAN, but I think this is the right level of conversation that's instructive. I think people get really heated about some of this stuff. Oh, yeah. And I, th- yeah. And I think, one, that's not necessarily useful. Uh, I, I I think there was a there, there was a session where things got really heated and some people nearly uh, were escorted out of the building, which is, which is not, we, we don't need to be, we, we really? don't need to be, we, we don't, we don't oh, yeah. need to be, we don't need to be at that, at that level, but I think another way of putting, you know, what you guys are, are talking about is, you know, there was an announcement out there uh, from from Vodafone of having 30% of its sites being on Open RAN. Um, was it 2030? Um, I've got to go back and look at that, which is which is great. But you can also flip that around and go, how many? Right, that still says the vast majority will not be, and you know, this is a, an operator who is driving this faster than, than many. So I think 100%. I don't think anyone should have any. No one should have any sort of preconceived notion or think someone's saying that, that this is going to take over tomorrow, right? right because right. that's just that's just silly. And 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 when I do see some of these knocks going, oh, it's it's going to take years, and you know, hey, everyone's going to recognize that even in you know five years, it's still going to be small. You know, this stuff does take time, right? So okay. I think I think you guys are right, and I think because it takes time, there is time for the industry to think about this and go, okay, how where is proprietary make sense? How do we mix and match proprietary right. with open where does open make sense um yeah because no one expects this is going to be taking place you know it's going to revolutionize the world tomorrow it is right. it's, it's got to be a long, yeah. long long journey right and, and at the end of the day it, this this is all uh, it, it's an architectural decision by the operator they will adopt varying levels of um commitment an application of open principles you know that's how it always is you go into any enterprise they have different philosophies on how they build out their networks maintain their networks operate their networks and and uh and manage the full life cycle of uh the network and everything that it runs on so uh, yeah i i i think these are uh, 
these are important also, things. And... It's their appetite for risk, like anything. Yeah. You know, that's part of their there calculus. Go. Yeah. It's all yeah. risk stuff like that. Is it ready? You know, we're putting yeah. SLAs and customers on the line here. Are we ready to do that? Yeah. Are you ready to lose your job if it doesn't work yeah. out today? You know, I mean, well, it's like it, anything. Yeah. Like, and that goes back that goes back to the timing, right? That that goes back to why it's not gonna happen. You know, you're not gonna be shifting everything you're doing tomorrow, right? Because you have to look at that risk. I, I would say the one thing that is different is on an enterprise side, you, you're right in terms of how enterprises build their networks, but it's not often that the C-suite necessarily is making some of those calls. I mean, in some cases, sure, depending on the size, but I think Open RAN has gotten as far as it has in part because the C-suite of some major operators has said this is important, right? It, it wouldn't, if it was left to the network guys, you know, and, and you know, Still, despite the number of, you know, and the diversity of the speakers and the attendees at, at MWC, we know there's a lot of old white guys um, or old national guys, whatever country they are in, running networks. And it's easy to do what you've been doing, right? Someone, someone once told me going, yeah, you know, if, 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 if I'm a, you know, if, if I'm a business manager and a part of a network and I'm five year runway to my pension, do I want to do something different? You know, do I want to do something different that's going to require a lot of work and maybe get me fired? Or do I just want to keep doing what I'm doing, right? And so I think you, we wouldn't be where we were with Open RAN if it wasn't C-suite folks saying, look, this is a priority for whatever reason they, they decided to do that, whether it's innovation, whether it's supply chain, whether whatever it is. And that does um, maybe put some different people's jobs on the line, Rob. <laughs> do, you, do, I, do, I want to, do I want to risk? Does that big bet not play off and, and other people? Yeah. And maybe they don't expect to be around that anyways. But I think that gives it a bit more of a, um, yeah, a bit of a different urgency. Yeah. Well, there you have it from GSMA Intelligence. So, hey, guys. Uh, so I want to talk about the big thing, the thing that we all want to talk about, which is You're gonna Peter's say favorite thing. Tapas. No, uh, <laughs> blackberry mojitos. No, um, Rioja. No, oh. metaverse. Oh, the metaverse. Metaverse. I thought I was going to become a wine conversation. I was really. <laughs> I was hoping for a wine <laughs> conversation. So. Yeah. 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 What? What? What did you guys think? Well, it's a use case for this stuff, right? Um, <laughs> a use you know, case for this stuff. Well, you know, I was wondering, you know, because you're right, a certain person on this in this call here was predicting metaverse was going to be the big thing for this event. If I recall, looking through my little, you know, my I mobile think, call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but but let's let, let's be clear. I think in the first par I think in the first paragraph, I admitted it was clickbait. Uh, I was I was very clear. The title was there. You the title go. Was, was I I have no shame. Uh, yeah. No, but you. I think I think. The interest is, and someone again, this really, you're so right about sort of the hearing things and talking with people. The thing I heard from one person, which was put the hype aside, what they thought was interesting was we spent so many years talking about supply side drivers for 5G, right? Well, right. we've got these networks and the devices are here. And, and now at least there's discussion of a demand, potential demand side, you know, demand side driver that, oh, there's going to be this metaverse thing that could drive it, which I think, you know, more than anything, hype side. And I didn't ride, did any, did either of you ride the roller coaster, the SK? Oh, SK Telecom. I, I, I stood underneath it while people were going all over the place. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I yes. almost, yeah. Did you try it? I, I, I did. I, I don't wait in line. I don't have time to wait in line. I was worried yeah, about neither do I. And I, the line I, was really I, long. <laughs> wearing a goggle and moving, I would not have stood underneath it without a hat uh, for the. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, I've seen too many life. YouTube videos of county fairs with stuff like that. We're like, oh, yeah. so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was kind of crazy. Um, you know what? You're you're right. It's interesting to you know Peter talking about supply side stuff. We're pushing on a string, you know, rather than saying, "Is the customer asking for this? Are there use cases that need this?" Like, if we went back in time, we had this idea that, well, we, we know that. Consumers on their smartphones are using more and more data and doing videos. We also had this vision of IoT driving lots more data, and we're still waiting on that to happen, at least in cellular. And so we need what's the next what's the next sucker of massive amounts of data? And it's clearly the metaverse. 
Um, you know, it's going to eat more data than anything ever. And so unless a whole bunch of people are going to be running around with cat six ethernet cables on their headsets, which they probably won't want to do, <laughs> then it's up to us, you know, to come up with the wireless alternative to high speed, you know, ethernet stuff. Right. And so there will be this battle as there always is a battle Royale with, you know, is 5g going to be enough is, I, I saw lots of a smattering of 6G marketing going oh, no. on all over the place. Um, um, but yes, what's what's going to be enough to drive that? You know, because you're going to be battling against Wi-Fi, I guess, right? In, indoors. Um, and yeah, but Metaverse is a great use case for it. Uh, we, I, I did, I did, I did see a Wi-Fi seven announcement. Which, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> there, yeah, Qualcomm. Yes. Yeah. yes. You're right. Wi-Fi yeah. seven for the win. I, per, I, you yeah. know, people it's, yeah. it, it's marketers gone wild. I think yeah. a lot of places like all the six G stuff I saw, uh -huh. it's not like even aspirational stuff. Like one day we'll get to six G and we think it could be like this. It was more authoritative. We're telling you what it is right now. And here's how you're <laughs> going to use it. I saw that everywhere. Yeah. And you know how it is. There's a high percentage of people who are attending this event don't know what they don't know. And they're just, they learn from what they see and they, yeah. a lot of them are going to believe it, you yeah. know, and we don't know what 6G well, is going to be like. So Peter, I have a recommendation for next year. Why don't you have a panel and entitle the panel, what is metaverse? And if you want to see people get like sort of, I don't know if you want to call it violent or, you know, uh, WWE ish, that might be a good one to have. No, right. so I think I think no. It's, I'm it's really happy to point. moderate. No, it's a it's a it's it's a really good point. For the record, uh, I I don't I don't get to to pick topics for uh, that that's okay. that's about my, my pay grade. Every now and then okay. I, I I get we, we do get a couple sessions. We had two that this last year. We had a uh, little bit at, at MWC uh, LA last year. But uh, it's a it's it's a good point because I think that calls out a bit of the difference, I think, between what Rob was saying about 6G versus Metaverse, right? Yeah. I think in a lot of cases, 6G, there's a lot of people saying, this is what 6G is gonna be like. The conversation around Metaverse felt more like, let's talk about what it could be or give yeah. some views, because to your point, Leonard, no one no one really knows. I mean, I, I had conversations with some people who were saying, there's all this discussion of Metaverse. My 23-year-old son, who's still at home, and I would really love them to get a better job, is sitting at home playing games all day, Yeah aren't they in the metaverse right and i think there are these questions of like where is the line between what people are doing you know now in gaming versus the metaverse right and, yeah. right and what what are we really talking about what's the net new i mean that's why i always ask about like whether it's 5g or edge computing or what have you it's like what is the net new because there's a lot of old stuff you're packing into this thing right just to your point peter but, you know, my, my general impression, I did check out some of the metaverse stuff. And, you know, I, I think most of it kind of disappointed. Um, I mean, one of, one of the things that really impressed me was how, how little progress there really has been on the content side, on the interface side. Uh, I was just surprised. Because you know, I've been I've been covering and looking at the VR XR, uh, you know, the XR stuff for a long time, ever since I was at Gartner, uh, and even before then, uh, and, and and so that was one of the things that really surprised me is how how we haven't really moved that far, uh, despite a lot of this excitement that's building around this concept called metaverse. And, you know, obviously the experiential interfaces are going to be a key to uh, what a lot of the metaverse acolytes or at least one side of the religion are going to assert are going to be critical. And it's just not moving all that well. Um, so I, I don't know if you saw anything that really kind of uh, impressed you and changed your your thought it, you know you saw something catalytic or revolutionary but I, I didn't encounter anything there's a lot of incrementalism in the ar vr space uh mixed yeah. reality you know uh, obviously i was at microsoft when we started building hololens yeah and that was exciting and um you know alex kitman's driving a lot of stuff there the folks at magic leap obviously oculus at meta i just said that and you know but but it has been more incremental than they probably like it to be, right? Because right? yeah. there's all that tech. 
uh, and trying to get it small enough and lightweight enough and everything and create this immersive oh. world. Um, and so everybody's got to do their part. So those guys are working around the clock, but it does feel like it's, you know, one step forward, two steps back with them. Um, and then on our side, on the data side, telecom, right, we've got to be make sure we're ready to provide them with the amount of that mega pipe bandwidth uh, to bring that stuff to life, not just in a super tightly controlled situation, right? Yeah. Um, which is huge. So every everybody's got a role to play. Yeah. Um, and yes, I don't want to just be a typical jaded person about all these things. <laughs> yeah. I guess how, how much, and maybe this is an open question for you guys. I mean, how much agreed, like, you know, digital twins are a big thing that you heard people bringing up, particularly within enterprise use cases, the metaverse, which, you know, every time I read something and, and it's a bit of a, you know, particularly when I see someone from my team who writes about something, and then there's the concept of, I'm like, don't, you're talking about the concept of like, it's new, right? Like, right. like let's be, but, but, but. I think when someone from my team writes it like that, it's in part because some people might not know what it is. And so, I mean, as much as when I hear people talk about, well, in the metaverse, and there's these digital twin things. I'm like, wow, we, we've been, was it 20? I mean, is it 2011, right? Like, like, like but yeah. given that there's a whole bunch of people who haven't been talking about this as part of the value, it gets hyped. And those folks who had never heard of it goes, oh, there's this cool digital twin things yeah. that I... And, and it's a way of introducing them to something that maybe 10 years ago wasn't really mature and maybe is closer to maturity. And now they're like, oh, I can see how to put it. I guess I wonder how much of this is just an education exercise Yeah, uh, that it's taken so long, but it takes a while yeah. for this to mature. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, the, idea, the idea of digital twins being a, a component of the metaverse, you know, digital twins came out of NASA and manufacturing to, to model machines on a factory floor or an aircraft engine, right? Um, and now, it, but but yeah, I've been deep into digital twins for a long time, building on that technology. Yeah. And, uh, and you're right, we would talk about why can't a person be a digital twin or a patient in a hospital? Yeah. In addition to a car or whatever. Sure. And right. so, yeah, yeah uh, you know, we'll take old things and put them all together to create a new thing. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's and you throw and you throw in of, NFTs. I mean, right? You throw well, in NFTs. Throw in NFTs. NFTs. <laughs> and it's all. It's, all, uh, it's all the cool. glue. It's the glue. <laughs> it's the glue, Peter. So absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. So, oh gen gentlemen, I wanted to uh, move on to announcements. Were there any that kind of popped for you guys that really made a statement at the event that you thought, "Hey, people got to know about this." Let's start off with Peter. You saw a lot of stuff. I know you had what, like sixty meetings. I only had half of that. Just well, because well, I, but they I, were, I was, I was, I was running. I, I was running around a lot, and I, I just don't say no, uh, which is, which is not, <laughs> not good. I mean, I think you know a couple of the announcements. And I talked about 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 some of them. Yeah. You know, I, rather than single announcements, I'd say sort of the plethora of things Qualcomm did. You know, Qualcomm yeah. always goes big, but I think the, you know, the discussion of how they're supporting various different folks with Open RAN on the RAN side of things, again, that diversity side of things, the partnership with Microsoft on private networks, they really, you know, I think they really went went big. One of those partnerships with Rakuten, clearly Rakuten was the other one that went big, right? Everything in terms yeah. of, you know, onboarding, you know, Nokia into the Symphony solution of what they launched there, the, the push before uh, MWC into Europe and the European markets that they announced uh, yeah. the acquisition of Robin IO. I, I think, uh, yeah. you know, they're clearly making it, you're saying they're, they're here, but, you know, I think the one thing that, that may have gone unnoticed because it was definitely not, definitely not flashy um, was, you know, Orange announced that, you know, they were going to, um, by the end of the decade, so 2030, phase out 2G and 3G. I think it's interesting because on the one hand, you go, wow, that's big. On the other hand, you go end of 2030 phasing out 2G and 3G. Like that seems so far away for 2G and 3G. And, and, and that's not at all a ding on orange as much as a reminder of how complicated it is to show. I mean, that means that in 2030, around the time 6G is launching, 2G and 3G will be shut down. And I, I think it's, again, it, it's not at all a, a comment on an orange as much as it is just a reminder that this stuff sticks around for a while. Right. It, and yeah. the complication of running it all. And, and I mean, you've seen probably in the US, right? Some of the, 
when operators try and shut down networks, yeah. some of the, oh no, you gave us 10 year notice yeah. that you were doing this, but we're still going to complain. I mean, it's, right. it's yeah. really, really tough. You're you right. Know. All those M to M things that are using GPRS, <laughs> 3G, yeah. you know, it's like, wait, you yeah. can't do this to us. We're all going to die, you know, or yeah. so much stuff was baked into machines or cars, hard coded, not able to be switched out or changed. And so you're right those people are going to complain the most. You, you know what? I love that, Peter, because you know what? Your statement there and, and your bringing up of this whole orange announcement is probably, a, it should be a stark reminder to the IT folks who are coming in here into the industry with their agile concepts and DevOps and all that, that infrastructure has a lot of dependencies and a lot of these dependencies move slowly and that you know as much as you might want to hypercharge and accelerate quote unquote innovation on top of infrastructure sometimes it just moves slow and it, and the investments that are made in infrastructure have a different time frame than what we see in IT and so, yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's something that I've actually been writing about because, you know, I'm like this uh, big student of Agile and DevOps. You know, I've been, I used to run those types of teams a long time ago when I was doing consulting work and uh, building systems, um, you know, back in the dot-com era. Uh, but there's a place for this stuff. And I think uh, some I think the in industry needs to be re reminded of that. And I, I'm glad that you brought that up because I think it's a really important, important point. Yeah, we see we see a, we see a programming device behind you. See, uh, you know, this is what yeah. happens when you come on a, a next curve uh, podcast, yeah. Peter, you, you, you know, I inspire you to say crazy stuff, crazy good stuff. It's awesome. I love it. But what Peter also talks about, in addition to just thinking about infrastructure and how hard it is to get off of things and people take long-term dependencies on it, this also plays into a bigger thing of just telecom economics, right? Yeah. We have all these people talking about going to 5G and how we're going to go to 6G and how much of the world is still just on 3G. And maybe mm -hmm. one day we'll get onto LTE, maybe. And... <laughs> People, but though people forget, you know, because a lot of times I'll, uh, you know, obviously we all read a lot of the same stuff out there in the media and, and things yeah. about the space we play in. And so I'll see people flaming other people. It's like, how in the world can you talk about 6G? The, the, the people who are doing 5G are up to their eyeballs in debt in order to, uh, to get spectrum from auctions and buy the gear to roll out stuff in addition to all the debt that they already have uh, to make that happen. And some people I, I hear, you know, some people say there shouldn't ever be a 6G. And I know that yeah. sounds kind of crazy or weird, but at the same time, if you think about the economics of things, if, if going to 6G keeps meaning new spectrum and crazy talk about terahertz <laughs> when millimeter wave is, you know, great for a football stadium, right? Um, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of discussions here that go outside of technology. And so retiring 2G and 3G networks at 2030, a lot of people who are in charge of the money that keeps these companies solvent would probably be saying, I need you to retire those tomorrow yeah. because we need to free up that spectrum to put this new stuff on because we cannot afford the tens of billions of dollars it takes to keep buying more spectrum to do the next G. Yeah. Does that make yeah, sense? I think it, no, hundred hundred percent. I think two two takeaways there for me is one, you know, I'm I'm really lucky that I have a team of super smart folks that I work with, and I mean we we did some work. Happy to reference it, yeah, to Leonard, if please, you want to include. But we we, we did some work a, a while ago where you know we looked at the impact of spectrum costs on consumer outcomes, right? And and it's one of those things that it's it's we're like you know well we're pretty sure high spectrum prices are bad for consumers and you just sort of say that and someone's like well can we actually prove it and so you know a bunch of my you know economist team spent time and it, yeah it, it's logical and, and it works out right if you have less money if you're spending more money on spectrum you have less money to build out your networks right yeah. and you're not going to build those networks out but i think the bigger thing for me is a, a more of, a, of an mwc sort of takeaways is it's all about timing right i mean i mean all these discussions are, are about timing right 6g 100 right. we know we're going to need it at some point when who knows right, right? we know we'll need more efficiencies millimeter wave you're right in, in a lot of cases millimeter wave 
might be a tough a tough sell but when demand is high right when when those you know demand for capacity is up there and that's the spectrum you have and given how much is over there it makes economic sense it's just a question of when and, and for who and it's the same thing with metaverse right do we do we think the metaverse will become the internet in the future i've got no doubt is that two three four five ten years from now i have no idea right but i mean it's it's it, it really is the crystal ball folks uh, that's why i'm glad i i've I'm not involved in our forecasts because that stuff keeps me up at night and gives me heartburn. But it's really the question of, of when, of, of the when that, uh, yeah, uh, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, at this point, oftentimes it's what, what is it we're talking about? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, 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 you know, speaking of forecasts, oftentimes you can't do a good one without really defining well the what. Right. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, you know that well. Peter, I know, because it keeps you up at night. <laughs> it does. It really does. <laughs> yeah. So you know, uh, I'll, I'll give a shout out for an announcement that probably didn't get as much press that wasn't as yes. big, but but it was an announcement at IoT Stars from our friend Earjap Groot from Igneon, the making antennas for IoT devices. And they, they launched a new kind of antenna intelligence cloud that's powered by AWS. Yeah. So there is there's your maybe a little more obscure announcement from MWC, um, but it turns out antennas are a thing for your IoT devices to get better connectivity on cellular networks. A lot of people just kind of blow off or don't think about antennas, right? Yeah. Um, and so there you go. Props to Igneon for their announcement. <laughs> I, I mean, and antennas are, I mean, I, I always feel a little embarrassed when I want to talk about them because people are like, oh, you know, you're afraid you're gonna put, they're going to put, you know, be put to sleep, but yeah. you know, <laughs> Actual sleep, not not like you would your 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 pet, but um, you know they're really the the. I mean, we should be talking about them so much more because whether yeah. it's on the you know IoT device side or yeah. what you can do with your phone or the fact that you know we've gone from you know to transmit to receive to four transmit four receive to like sixty four by sixty four or these massive MIMO solutions right. that have really driven coverage and capacity in all these bands. It's they're kind of really, really, really probably more important than almost anything in the network now. Oh yeah. 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 And, and they're, they're the, a big constraint at the moment as well. Right. You know, um, the, and so, okay. For me, I, I, I have to, I have a hard job here because I have, there were so many announcements. I was inundated with so many. I have to figure out one that's really interesting. Um, that really stands out. But one of the things that I thought was interesting, I, I, I did go to the Mavenir booth and I met with John Baker and toward the end of our uh, discussion, he showed me their array of um, antennas, RU units and small cells. And I was listening to him kind of describe each of the units and it occurred to me that um, a lot of the software players in the open RAN space are now getting into hardware. And so if you look at what Parallel Wireless is doing, they're starting to tighten their relationship with, uh, you know, the hardware guys, especially the radio guys, speaking of radios and antennas. Uh, and um, one of the things that I think we need to consider here because there's a lot of talk about how software is eating the world. You heard everybody say it ad nauseum actually at Mobile World Congress. But, you know, the fact of the matter is the theme that is even more important for Open RAN is hardware. You know, like you're saying, the antenna, you know, the RU unit, and what you're running on the DU, how how you're accelerating different workloads for L1, 2, 3 processing, where you distribute it, blah, blah. That's all dictated by hardware. And I had a, a really interesting exchange with um, the folks at Samsung about the uh, hardware life cycle. And there's a lot of stuff that we don't talk about. Uh, that uh, we ended up discussing there in terms of the innovation life cycle or the engineering life cycle of these radios uh, and what needs to be considered there in terms of how you design um, your RAN. Uh, and it changes over time where you put the software and where you actually embed the software in hardware. 
that line is constantly moving. And so, yeah, that, that I, I think that was that maybe not an announcement. It was an interaction that I had with the Mavenir f- folks that kind of uh, lit a, uh, made a light bulb, light, light bulb go off in my head. So they're proud of their, they're proud of the radio wall. They're really that. Yeah, that, you that, saw that too, right? That, that big wall of radios. Yeah. Yeah. I think. I mean, yeah. And it's good. I mean, I, I remember it was probably a few years ago. Uh, Steve Papa from from Parallel was talking about how you know the real concern or the real need for the industry from a supply chain perspective is you know U.S. based radio solutions and getting U.S. production uh, of radios and particularly massive MIMO type radios. And I think yeah. you see that coming together, and it's a good um, yeah yeah a good show yeah. So yeah. really quickly, gentlemen, key takeaways. Uh, I, well, we've kind of done takeaways, but what are the themes that you think are going to, uh, what is the theme? Let's, let's isolate it down to one. Uh, what is that theme that you think is going to carry us uh, from now until the next Mobile World Congress? What will shape our industry? Mm. Wow. I think we've already used up everything we were going to say, dude. <laughs> what were you thinking, man? Um, might have, <laughs> might have, might have, might have. Um, before you ask that question, I just had another comment to make on a kind of a, a trend or a theme I saw in uh-huh. mobile Congress over the years. Um, and so I don't want this to be a hundred percent a love fest, but, you know, it, we, we need to have a little bit of constructive criticism. Yeah. You know, a lot of us have been going since the three GSM days and there's been a trend in, uh, what I would call the, the paywall. A phenomenon, uh, an increasing every year, an increasing number of the uh, vendors with their stands. It's basically you just walk up to a wall and there's a person, a, a bouncer in front of the nightclub with a list saying, are you on the list for an appointment to come see all this magical stuff that we've created for a meeting? And I totally get that. And a lot of us are accustomed to that. I guess my takeaway is every year, an increasing number of the vendors are doing that. And I worry about all the people who spend a lot of money to f- fly to Barcelona to see the future and all this magical stuff. Cause I certainly remember how it's been over the years where every vendor is wide open showing all their wares and all this great stuff. And you get to touch it and everybody gets to see it. And it's kind of a magical thing. That's what's been so magical about MWC. And so a worrying trend is as vendors more and more do that and don't have a place for regular folks to see stuff, uh, I, I worry if that will have an impact. And so um, I'm shouting out to all of the vendors at MWC, think about all these people who are there coming to Disneyland to, to see the future and give some more thought about letting them see this stuff rather than making sure they're on a list to go behind a wall to have specialized meetings and stuff like that. So I'll say piggybacking off that, my, my takeaway was... I think we saw an, an, a number of people coming from outside the telco industry. Yeah. We saw a broad set of folks who talked about 4YFN. For me, the big takeaway was just, and this kind of goes back to, to what Rob was saying, sort of that mixing and matching and the broadening uh, of the space, right? Where it used to be a telco show and we thought of it as a telco show and it's becoming more. It does make it more important for those other folks coming in to your point, Rob, of, of people being able to see this stuff. But for me, that was the big takeaway, right? Is this, it's what I think the the show is trying to capture with the theme of, of uh, you know, connectivity unleashed, this idea of, of what happens when we, you know, break it past telco, we open it up. Uh, and I think you saw that with, you know, sort of the industrial focus, a lot of the IoT side of things, really trying to talk about what are the use cases that are more than connectivity, but more than just telco. And I think that was, for me, that was a sure. big takeaway. Yeah. Sure, because you're right. Telco show, telco show. And then at some point in the past, the smartphone revolution happened. And that's when MWC yeah. went into the stratosphere. Yeah. It was because of smartphones. It wasn't yeah. because of networks. It was because of smartphones. It brought in people who never imagined they were going to go to this thing because Samsung would do their big unpacked event the first night. Everybody except Apple was going to be there. And it was it was magical. It was like Christmas yeah. morning opening up and going, what is the news? Because that's what's relatable to the masses of people, right? Is something they can see and touch. They can't see and touch uh, cellular networks. And so, uh, 100%. 100%. As, but as we have, we, we, we're, as we're seeing less of it being a smartphone show than it has been, 
Yeah. Um, you know, we, we have to, we got to think about that. And so to your point, yeah, it's, it's all the, what are all these hot new use cases? And I imagine next year they're going to turn the volume up to 10 or 11 on metaverse <laughs> yeah. and other things I'm sure. Yeah. Well, for me, it's squid games. And if you don't know what I mean, we have an episode of a rethink <sighs> podcast called the state of open ran. So watch it. If you're curious what I mean by squid games, squid games so uh, gentlemen it was great it was great i i really appreciate you both of you jumping on and uh sharing your thoughts and perspectives on mobile world congress 2022 uh and for our audience if uh you would like to um you know subscribe subscribe to our youtube channel and apple podcast you can uh, go and look us up at there or just visit our media channel or media center at www.next-curve.com. And until next time and the next Mobile World Congress 2023, uh, um, take care. We'll see you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Great stuff. Visit us at www.next-curve.com.